I may have had an opportunity to already send one or two of you an email. I can't really remember. I sent a lot of them out and stuff like that. But no matter what, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come and see the fabulous and wonderful toys that the good folks at Tesla make. Did everybody have a chance to see the cars? Yes. yes. You touch the car. Yes. They're real, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, who really enjoyed driving the Model 3? But it was what, an S and an X, right? Would you like to have one of those? Oh, you think you could live with one of those? Yeah. <laughs> so tonight when you're driving home, are you going to be going, I'm disappointed? <laughs> well, on that note, I brought some overnight vouchers for a few people. So uh, those who test drove are going to be automatically entered, and anyone else who didn't test drive, if they want to hand off their contact information, I brought a little fish bowl here. Wow. Um, so you can either write on a piece of paper, or if you have a business card, you can throw it in here, and we'll put it in the iPad, and the iPad picks people. What? What's so you get to bring home a Tesla for a few days, drive around the town. You get to bring home a Tesla Not for a Tesla, but for a short period of time. Does that smell like a, a rash of selfies? I'll get to see you in So I guess, I guess we can uh, pass this bowl down. I don't know what to do. Okay, if you already drove, you don't have to throw it in here. We already got your information. If you guys want to pass that down. So, sorry to interrupt, but... Well, that's really freaking cool, man. You have to make it. Uh, next week, we're going to have General Dynamics come in and talk about the F-16. They have a similar program. So that's just <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not. Yeah, uh, anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys coming. So I'm just here to kick things off. So I'm Jim Anderson. I'm the guy who set it up tonight. And I thank you once again. Thank you so much for joining us. But now I'm going to sit down. And the reason I'm going to sit down is because the good folks from Tesla are going to give us a little bit of an overview of their fabulous and wonderful products and the wonderful things probably coming down the pike and what they can do and what they can't do and all that sort of stuff like that. And when they're done with their presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And now that you've touched and filled and drove, I'm sure that the questions are just rolling up inside. So this should be pretty good. Sound like a fair deal? Yes, sir. Take it away, sir. All right. So my name is Brad, everybody. Nice to meet you. I actually work in sales. I work in marketing. I work in delivery. Um, everything but engineering. So that being said, uh, we're not going to get too specific on the questions. Um, so making this PowerPoint, I'm kind of back and forth with corporate. There's a lot of stuff I can say. There's a lot of stuff I can't say. There's a lot of stuff I can't show pictures of, so I have to do generic pictures. Uh, so this was a nightmare, but it was a lot of fun making. Um, so if you do have specific engineering questions you want to answer, uh, I'm pretty much going to send a follow-up email to everybody. Anybody who emails me, I'm going to send that to our engineers out in Fremont. Um, which is where 99% of all of our engineers live, um, and they're going to kind of go through me to re-answer those questions to you. Um, if you have any solar questions, I have the business card of our Tampa Solar guys, um, and they can answer any of those questions as well. Um, that being said, I'm going to get into the thick of it here. Um, and kind of my verbal index of the way that this is going to go, I have my generic presentation, which I'm kind of starting with, kind of giving the background, the history of our company, where we're headed, where we're going. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the mechanics behind the motors, the inverter, the battery pack, and all that good stuff. Uh, I don't talk about the Model 3 much in here, uh, mostly because we haven't fully released how the Model 3 works. Um, and kind of a teaser, the technology behind it is even more simple than I'm going to go over right now. And the technology I'm going over doesn't even baffle me, and I don't really understand technology all that much. Um, so really the idea, and we're not a car company, I hope you all understand that, we are an energy company. So the idea behind our company is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. We're going to do that in three ways. Um, so you've got the test drove, the S and the X, you are looking at a Model 3 picture right there, um, and there are two Model 3s in Florida right now, so be on the lookout for those. Um, so we have these electric cars that store electric energy. Um, most people right now are charging at home, so they're actually using fossil fuels. Um, and I'm going to talk down a little bit because I am in the TGO building right now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but we do have the power wall. I'm not sure if any of you have been on our website and kind of checked out our energy products, but what that essentially is is the Tesla battery pack that goes in the cars mounted on the wall. Now this is dry battery technology, which I'm going to get into shortly. And then we have our solar panels. Um, that is actually our solar roof, which is a whole animal in its own. Um, if you're wondering anything about that, if you want to buy those today and put your money down, there's about a four-year waiting period, so I'm not really going to talk about those at all. Um, so we do have solar panels, though, and we do have solar roofs, which, I'm, like I said, I'm not really going to get into. Um, so a little bit about the history of our company. Um, I'm sure you've all heard Elon Musk's name kind of ring around your life all the time. That's all I ever hear. Um, so he founded our company in 2003, and our first car ever was the Roadster. Um, and actually, the majority of the Roadsters are found in Florida right now, which is pretty neat. 
<laughs> the Roadster was an all-electric two-gear car, which is different from the cars we have today. Um, we built those on the Lotus frame. It was not a production car. Um, we basically, we didn't build it from the ground up. We took a frame of another car and we tried to stuff our own car into it. There's a lot of issues with those cars. Uh, in fact, the fastest Roadster is slower than our slowest SUV is now. Um, so they're not even like, you know, I mean, they're toys. Uh, they're, they're neat though. Um, and so after the Roadster, we opened our first store. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how we opened a store about three years before we introduced our first real product, but we did. Um, so we came up with the Model S in 2012, and that has changed slightly since then. It came out with no backup sensors or anything, no autopilot hardware. Um, the first car ever was a 45 kilowatt hour battery, which I'm gonna get into what that means. Um, since then, we've added eight cameras, 360 sonar, infrared cameras, 1080p, everything. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. Um, we had our IPO in 2010. Um, if you were lucky to get on there, you probably wouldn't even be sitting in this room. You'd be out in the Bahamas right now. Um, and then after that, we opened up our Gigafactory, or we really announced it. We're not even done with the Gigafactory. We probably won't be done for a few years. Um, being, and I'm gonna get to that, being that it's the second largest building in the world, we are fully open in many parts of it, and we started producing the Model 3s there. Um, after we came out with the Model S, we came out with our first supercharger. The difference between a supercharger and a destination charger is the amount of energy that it puts out. So, like, a building like this might have a destination charger installed by Tesla on it. Those will charge your car at a rate of 35 miles per hour, which is extremely slow. So if you want to drive from here to Boston, it would take you about three and a half weeks to do that. Um, that's why we invented the supercharger. Those will charge you at about 170 miles per half an hour. Wow. Um, and those sort of vary. And we're, we're in the middle of toying with technologies. We can fully charge a Tesla right now in three minutes. It destroys the battery packs. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> but it shows you what our ability is. So once we figure out things to put in place to protect our batteries, you know, you're going to be filling up quicker than you can at a gas station. Wow. Um, hmm. Our supercharging network right now um, is basically all over the world. So you can drive through Canada, you can drive through Mexico, and all over the U.S. Uh, and I'll show you some maps coming up here. After the Model S, we introduced dual motors. When I talk about these cars today, I'm only going to talk about dual motors. And that's because last week we went from having um, a rear-wheel drive Model S entry car to everything is dual motors. So everything is front and rear-wheel drive. It's not four-wheel drive, so each wheel is not independently operated, but each axle is. Um, then we came out with the Model X. That was really about a year and a half ago now. Um, that is like a really cool feat of engineering. So it's basically the same exact car as the Model S. Uh, almost every single component is the same, but we put a different chassis on it. So the Falcon Wing doors, I'm not sure if you played with those much outside, uh, but those have sonar on the roof and the side, so they're not gonna hit anything. They're double hinge technique, so they can open in a variety of ways. Uh, it's a really neat car. Um, and of course, the over the head windshield. If any of you drove it today, I'm sure you noticed that. Uh, and then we announced some other factories. We have a assembly plan out in Europe. Um, and of course, the autopilot hardware we came out with in 2015 is always developing. And now the Model 3. Um, so I can answer a little bit about that, but I can't really get into too much about that, mostly because we're a publicly traded company and I don't know anything about it. Uh, even though they're being sold today, there's not much for me to tell you. So we have a secret master plan. If you ever follow Elon Musk's tweets, you can see he like, that is how our company is dictated. Much like uh, our president today, he'll like tweet something and then I wake up and like my whole job is literally different. <laughs> um, so we started out with a Roadster um, and his first tweet about the Model S came much before our official announcement. Uh, so we came out with the Model S and when he came out with that he said, I have these master plans. We're going to come out with the SUV which is really a crossover and then we're going to come out with our mid-size sedan which is the Model 3. He started, started announce he already started announcing our semi-truck return bailing in September. Uh, we're coming out with our pickup truck, we're coming out with our Model Y, which is the more affordable version of the Model X, uh, and we're coming out with a few other vehicles, and we're going to revisit the Sportster. Um, so the idea behind this is that we don't redesign our cars every year, but we go through this cycle. So by the time we hit the end of the cycle, which is the beginning, we're going to revisit the Sportster. Um, and this sort of allows these cars to depreciate at a lot slower rate than other cars would. So instead of redesigning the BMW 3 Series every year, we have our Model 3. Uh, if we won't redesign it for five years, your car won't depreciate as quickly. And through software updates, we can maintain the value. So Model 3, it has a 215 mile range. I'm sure this is gonna seem a little bit confusing to any of you who have been following this closely. So we're coming up with our larger battery pack before our entry level battery pack. So you might hear things that, oh, this has $35,000, but I've read it's 57, or this, that, or the other thing. So the $35,000 model won't really be available for a few months. Uh, that being said, it will be our entry level model, zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds. Uh, it'll be the safest mid-size sedan ever built. 
in the sedan that we have now, the Model S is the safest sedan ever built, and the SUV that we have is the only SUV to ever get a five-star crash test rating in every category, um, and I'm gonna go over why that is. And also, every car we ever built is gonna have autopilot hardware, so you're always gonna see the autopilot hardware, which is different from the software. So this is our supercharging network on the left. Uh, the red dots designate superchargers that are open. The gray ones are ones that are under construction that'll be open within three months. Uh, the black dots on the right-hand side are the destination chargers. Um, so the destination chargers aren't meant to be in convenient locations as far as long distance travel is concerned. They're meant to be at places that you might be going to dinner or might be staying at a hotel. They're still recharging rate. Both of these types of chargers are free. So if you drove a billion miles in the US, you'll be under warranty and you won't pay a penny for electricity. Um, at home, you're, you're probably paying an average of 12.5 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Uh, so every thousand miles you drive your car, it's going to cost you thirty dollars at home to charge, and that's sort of a rough estimate based off a few different assumptions. Um, but the idea is that we're constantly growing our network. Um, some things you're not going to hear me talk about during this presentation. I'm not going to be comparing to the Chevy Bolt or anything like that. But just to give you an idea, um, the Chevy Bolt's range is about two thirds of the Model S, and it would take uh, I think twenty times longer to get from here to New York than our Model S would be, and it costs you infinite amount more dollars because you have to pay for the charging as you will. Um, but that'll be the last I mentioned of our competitors. <laughs> um, so our superchargers are not just in the US, they're all over the world here. Um, it's kind of funny if you if you jump in the car and you like scroll your touch screen over to the maps and you look at, you know, Saudi Arabia and all those countries, there's not a single electric charger of any company. Um, so there's like this whole dry spot of the world over there in the Middle East. But uh, otherwise you can drive pretty much anywhere else with a Tesla right now. Um, there are a few countries that have fees associated with that, um, but it will still be, on average, about 80% less than gasoline costs. So in Florida, um, we just opened a new supercharger three days ago in St. Petersburg, uh, which is really exciting. That's where I live. Um, so we have 185 destination chargers, and this is probably a little bit outdated. Uh, we build about three a week now. That's sort of our goal in Florida. Um, and we have 12 stores, which is actually 13 as of a week ago, so that's really exciting. Um, I can't change numbers on these slides, so I sent it to corporate back, and that's like a three-week process. So <laughs> I was like, whatever. Yeah, was that. Um, so that is what a supercharger looks like. If you notice, they're not they're not facilities built around these. Um, it's not like a gas station is going to be. We're not building a whole thing around it. We're going to put it in already existing spots. So when you're going on a road trip and you're using a supercharger, you're not going to be eating gas station food. Uh, you're going to be stopping somewhere right off the highway that has nice food. You know, the closest one to here is in Brandon. There's Chinese food, there's Mexican food, there's a Starbucks, there's a movie theater, a Macy's, a TJ Maxx. Uh, so it takes about 30 minutes to charge. So every three and a half hours you can stop for about 30 minutes to charge. Um, and I know I said it takes 30 minutes to get 170 miles, but the reason it takes 30 minutes to charge is because it takes the same amount of time to go from zero to 80% as 80 to 100. So on a road trip you don't actually charge 100% of the way. You only charge 80% of the way and move on. It's the only really time efficient manner to do that. and that's. The tapering of that is all has to do with protection of the battery. So, engineered from the ground up. So the Model S, X, and 3 are actually designed from the ground up, unlike the Roadster. Um, so these are pretty obvious that there's a battery pack. Uh, so we use an all aluminum construction. We originally designed it with a steel construction, but these cars are so heavy already, we had to sacrifice the steel for aluminum, which, I mean, every other car is made out of aluminum. And then we have the electric powertrain. So, safety first. There's no large engine in the front. When there's an engine, what happens when you get on a front end collision is the energy transfers through that engine onto the people, or the, en or the engine gets thrown through the dashboard onto you. So without having anything up there, which all there really is is medical grade air filters, carbon air filters, and a 12 volt car battery, then you have all this crumble zone. So it's a lot safer. There's no gas tank in the back, so there's a crumble zone in the back there as well. And the uh, steel slash aluminum construction of the frame makes it really safe. The battery pack itself weighs about 1,200 pounds, our smallest battery pack that is, and that is a 60 kilowatt hour battery. So all of the center of gravity is really low, it's really evened out, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more once I get into the battery construction. Um, but we are gonna watch, there's two videos I threw in this presentation, uh, they're only about two minutes long, and the first one is a customer video, and we are going to play that. That's okay, it's not gonna play for me. <laughs> sure. I'm not an engineer, I didn't, I didn't design any of this.
Maybe we'll try to tag it on at the end here. Um, it was just a story about a gentleman who had a Model S. He had an early 2012 one that didn't have any early collision warning features. And, uh, and his life was saved because he was on a front collision. Got very involved with Hyper. It's Windows 10, so it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Just complaining about this this is not that great for Windows 10. That's all right. That's all right. I can't help my own place. I'm trying to get through the system. Everything's hidden. Oh, yeah. All right. This is where I was going to put it. All right. So the autopilot hardware. Uh, so every car is built with autopilot hardware. What that means is every car can be fully autonomous if you buy the software. Um, so the hardware consists of eight cameras. 360 sonar and one forward-facing infrared camera. Um, so the National Highway Safety Administration tested our enhanced autopilot software and said it's 40% safer than if you were personally driving on the highway. So there's two differences we have here. We have enhanced autopilot and we have fully autonomous driving. Fully autonomous driving is not available today. It's all pending legislation. Um, and unfortunately, the next video I was gonna show you was the fully autonomous driving video, which you can view on our website. We got special permits in California to show that, but uh, we can't use that yet. So, enhanced autopilot, there's four components to that. We have highway driving, so it'll drive for you up to 90 miles an hour on the highway. It'll stop and go traffic for you, it'll stay in your lane, it'll change lanes for you. I mean, this is complete hands-free driving. I'm not really actually supposed to say that. You're supposed to stay engaged in the wheel and all that. Um, but the other day, I was driving uh, down to Miami for an event, and it was pouring rain out. Everybody was on the sides of the highway with their hazard lights on, and I was engaged at 90 miles an hour, <laughs> eating dinner with both hands, and just sitting by <laughs> um, So, and, and the reason I could do that at those speeds in the pouring rain is because of low center of gravity and the traction control. Really safe car, really good handling, just everything about it. Um, if the enhanced autopilot software could not read those lines in the road, if there was more rain than there would, would then it wouldn't engage, so it's not gonna put you in this gray area. It's either gonna work or it's not gonna work. Then we have local roads. So it can drive five miles over the speed limit on local roads, but it is very software limited. So this is the difference between fully autonomous driving and enhanced autopilot. Enhanced autopilot cannot read traffic signals. So if you are approaching a red light, engage in enhanced autopilot on a local road, it'll blow, blow right through that. <laughs> now it'll stop if there's a car in front of you stopping. It is all legislation based, it is not software based. It's, it's pretty frustrating. We're probably, and this is a total Elon Musk estimate, we're about a year away from fully releasing that. So, <laughs> in, so three years away. No. So he's going to be showcasing a fully autonomous drive from a parking lot in LA to a parking lot in New York City, and his words were, "He's not going to touch anything." So I think that includes wireless charging. Um, so we are toying with wireless charging. There's a huge loss on energy when that happens, so it's not as cost effective as it should be, but it makes it so you can fall asleep for two days and all of a sudden you're across the world. Um, so he's going to demonstrate that you know this year. So he says, uh, but I believe him. Um, the other parts of this would be auto park, so perpendicular and parallel parking. It's a completely different software from enhanced autopilot because it's not using painted lines. It's strictly using existing cars. So if you approached a parking lot with completely open parking spaces, it wouldn't be able to find a parking spot. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the downfall. You need to be in a parking lot where you have a car, then you have an open space and a car. So regardless of how those two cars are parked, it's going to park exactly equidistant between the two. So people can be double parked and all that. Um, the summon feature is more of a bar trick than anything. Um, basically, you can open your garage, pull your car inside, and close it without anybody being inside the vehicle. It will drive at about eight miles per hour below. It's going to use the sonar sensors and cameras to determine where it's supposed to be going. And if you have your garage hooked up to the car, it knows where your garage is. It'll pull itself inside. It's really helpful if you're trying to get to a skinny spot, uh, so you can park in front of the spot and then push your car back with either your key fob or your cell phone. And then auto lane change, which is part of the, which is part of the uh, highway driving. So autopilot hardware, like I just talked about, this improves over time through software updates. Um, software updates are frequent; they're almost daily. Um, but every three weeks, you're getting one that you have to accept terms and agreements to. So we just got one today for uh, Google Maps update, which we did not have to accept terms and agreements to. The most recent ones improved our zero to sixty time on all the cars. The ones before that. Um, we installed automatic emergency braking. 
the reason that's so important is now, if you bought a car in 2014 or later, and your car never had automatic emergency braking, which none of the Teslas did, and you thought people didn't need them because these cars were so safe, now every single one of these cars has it. If you bought any other car without automatic emergency braking, you have to buy an next year's model to get that feature. So these cars are literally becoming safer, they're becoming faster, they get a lot more, I want to say, toys inside. Um, we get more features on our music, more navigation features, um, so it's, it's really neat. Uh, and then we have something called Fleet Learning, which pairs with the over-the-air updates. What Fleet Learning is, is every Tesla on the road is collecting data for us. So this is done through the eight cameras, through the software, and through the sonar. So it's measuring everything from the distance between lines, to the gradient of the road, to the quality of the roads, the construction zones, flow of traffic, everything. So a car that's never left China has been on my test drive route 10,000 times because we have been on the test drive route right, 10,000 times. So these updates happen every time you turn the car off, your car gets updated. So, and I'm not sure how many of you have ever driven a Model S with the Enhanced Auto or X with the Enhanced Autopilot software, but a year ago it sort of felt like a drunk driver was driving. It was kind of like be in the line, but go back and forth and that sort of thing. Uh, we were able to improve that just by putting cars in the road. So every time someone buys a car, it's exponential growth. So we have uh, 1.97 billion miles logged with the Enhanced Autopilot software engaged. Um, other companies, like I said, I'm not really gonna go into it, but other companies have around 300,000 miles of log data. Um, so, because they have employees driving cars, someone's taking a laptop collecting data, when we have customers collecting data for us. We have three main plants that we like to talk about publicly, and probably about half a dozen other ones we like to talk about privately. <laughs> um, so these, we, we, the Model S and the Model X are produced in Fremont, California. Uh, the Model 3 is going to be produced in the Gigafactory as well as the battery production, which is, this is kind of the most important part about the Gigafactory. And then we have assembly plants in Europe. Uh, we have a solar sort of factory in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I'm not really sure the extent of what they do, um, but it exists. So our Fremont factory, like I said, is meant to build the Model S and the X. If you, any of you ever go out there, I recommend seeing it. There's indoor roller coasters, frozen yogurt stands. Uh, <laughs> that place is so clean you can eat off of it, just like our service centers. So I worked at a service center for about a year and I noticed that there's not a lick of oil anywhere. That's because there's only three fluids in the car. We have windshield wiper fluid, battery coolant fluid, which we flush every four years, and brake fluid we flush every two years. So none of that stuff is going to be spilling on the ground in our facilities. Um, so in the Fremont factory is really cool because there's a series of robots which we name after Marvel characters um, <laughs> that are like our superheroes. They're putting together our cars. Uh, there are humans there, so they're doing the inspections of the quality of work, which happens after every single robot touches the car. Um, but you can go online and watch different videos about how that's produced and how we stamp press everything and just the way that this works. When you order a car, you can literally, I could get on my cell phone right now, go to our website, custom build a car, it gets sent through a computer there, and that car goes through the assembly line, and I can get delivered to my driveway. So it's like ordering something from Amazon. It takes about eight weeks for that to happen, um, which is not a really long time to get a car from California over here. The Gigafactory. So this is the second largest building in the world, and it has more battery production than every building that produces batteries in the world combined. Um, so that's huge. So just through economies of scale, through both producing the Model 3 at a huge rate, which is 500,000 cars a year, and that amount of battery output, we're able to offer a car for $35,000. Mm -hmm. It's not the newest, oh, greatest no. Tesla in forms of the technology that you get to use as a user, um, but it is as far as the way battery production is, the way how efficient these batteries are. The batteries I'm going to talk about in this presentation are the Panasonic 18650 batteries that we've modified. The batteries in the Model 3 are a different battery that we produce in-house. Um, they just aren't allowed to tell me much about those batteries, and I'm not sure when they're going to, but uh, today I'm gonna to talk about our old batteries for the most part. Hey, quick question about that yes. picture that you just had up there, yeah. just, if you go back. There seems to be a wind farm in the upper right-hand corner. Is that your wind that farm? That is, um, or just happened this to is a CGI-produced image. I don't think that wind farm actually exists. Okay, I think that's fine. Even though the gate factory's already done, this is the image I'm allowed to use, um, and it doesn't really entirely look like that. Okay. <laughs> um, but the idea is that it's a solar factory, and you know, it's pretty much a net zero factory. Okay. Um, but we have no plans to get into wind turbines, <laughs> if that's what you're asking. Um, so this is our powertrain from the undercarriage. Uh, what you're looking at, that whole white bottom, that is our battery pack. It is encased in a titanium sleeve. Within that, there's a silicone sleeve, um, and then a microfiber material that sort of lets ions move freely within the cells. Um, and I'm gonna get to what that really means in a second. Uh, the two red pieces are our two motors. So this is what a dual motor looks like. 
we used to produce just rear wheel drive and gave the option for dual motor, but now we're just doing the all wheel drive. Um, the component next to that will be the uh, inverter. And then we have a single gear gearbox. I'm gonna get to all of that right now. So here's a real life image. We used to have these in stores. If you've ever been to a store previous to four months ago, you would have seen this. Uh, so you got to like touch things, feel things. All of the chassis that we put in the store all have the smart air suspension installed and they're all performance models, if you were wondering. Is that a four wheel there? Or two wheel? What's that? Is that all wheel drive? Oh yeah, they, all of our cars are all wheel drive, not four wheel drive, so the axles are moving independently, not the wheels. So there's how many engines in the front and in the back? We have a motor in the front and a motor in the back. Okay. So here's the updated version of that once we put the front bumper on. Um, thought you might be interested in seeing that. So this is the entire powertrain of the Tesla. So within the Tesla there are, and this is not talking about Model 3, within the Tesla there are 16 moving parts and four of those are tires. So there is really <laughs> not a whole lot going on. Um, and all we really have is the battery pack, which is composed of lithium-ion cells, and then we have the motor, the inverter, and the gearbox. When I'm saying gearbox, I'm really talking about a single gear attached to the axle that acts like a gearbox, but it's not really. Is it like a differential? There's an open differential on it, um, and the reason, normally you wouldn't want an open differential on a vehicle, you're gonna lose a lot of traction, um, but because of the low center of gravity and the ability for us to change the output of the motor instantly with, electric, with electricity, um, we don't need the closed differential that we would normally have. Um, but you do need to provide for the wheels on each side of the axle to rotate at different rates as the car turns. They rotate, the wheels on both sides rotate, um, so the, this, this is like the one thing that they didn't really want me getting into with the inverter and the open differential. Um, so, um, that being said, I'm mostly talking about the motors and the batteries. Uh, they were pretty limited, and you'll see when I start talking about them in the upcoming slides, I don't have pictures of them. I'm not allowed to use pictures of that kind of stuff. Uh, and the picture I'm using for the motor is just a general induction motor. It's not necessarily from a Tesla. Um, so, so the answer to my question is, it works. It works. <laughs> you hopefully tested it today and you were able to see that. What's the life of the battery? What's the life of the battery? Yeah. Um, so the... 90 kilowatt hour battery, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different batteries today. Um, we do different tests on different ones, but we said the 90 kilowatt hour battery, which has about a 300 mile range on the Model S, has, you lose about one to 2% efficiency every year. So we're expecting, now this is all expectations because we've only been out for a few years, uh, you're gonna lose about half your efficiency come about 25 to 30 years from now. So if it has a 300 mile range today, we're gonna to have about 150 mile range 30 years from now is the expectation. That's also under normal driving conditions and only charging your battery 90% of the way all the time, but you have the ability to kind of throttle how much you want to charge. Um, you're not using 10% of the battery at any given time. You're using 10% of each, every single battery when you use 10% of the battery, not of the battery pack. Yeah? Um, can you control the torque provided to each wheel separately or just each axle separately? Um, not as a consumer. So there's, uh, in those cars you were out today, there's a software download on them where you can literally play with everything and change yeah, yeah. things. I mean the computer in the car, not like a driver. Um, not really, no. Okay. It's, it's all software related, so that's why we were able to increase the zero to 60 times. So we went from some 540 pounds of instant torque on our smallest battery to about 600 pounds of torque. Um, and that was strictly through a software update, not through a hardware. Um, and the reason we did that is because we wanted our base model S to be as fast as possible so that the model 3 doesn't compare as much. Um, so the 0 to 60 time is 4.3 on our model S, um, and it used to be 5.1, but because the model 3 is 5.5, we wanted to make the model S a little bit better. What, um, is, the, what is the AC voltage of the motor? The AC um, it depends which motor, and I'm just about to get to that. We have different motors. Um, we have our let me, let me get into that before we get ahead of ourselves. Um, so typically we're talking about a three-phase, four-pole AC induction motor. Um, of course, our battery pack is a DC battery pack, so that's what the inverter's job is to do, is to one, convert to AC, and to two, to throttle the amount of energy going into the motor at any given point. Um, and these motors are both rear and front mounted, like I said. Um, in the, let me, let me say how to put this. So there's only, we only have the, the stator and the copper rotor. Um, the rotor speed is going to be controlled by the, uh, the RMF speed. So the rotating magnetic field of this. This is a constant speed because it's a three-phase induction motor as opposed to a two-phase. 
um, which is why, and I'm just about to get to this, which is why the electric motor is a lot more consistent and even acceleration than a gas engine because we don't have pistons, we don't have this offset of energy. It's a constant amount of energy that you can throttle at any point, which is really neat. Um, so this that we're looking at right now, this is our 60 kilowatt hour uh, motor that goes to our 60 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so we do have a performance motor, which is twice the size of, well it's not really twice the size, it's two of these connected together more or less, um, which is really neat. Uh, so some of you may have driven the P100D, that's what that means, the P means performance. So these are 270 kilowatt amount of, 270 kilowatts of energy are going through these motor at any given point. So the important thing to look at is the weight to power ratio, 8.5 kilowatts per kilogram. Comparing that to an internal combustion engine, um, so this is something that Tesla sent me from corporate. I'm not sure exactly which engine they are specifically talking about when giving you this ratio. Um, but just looking into the power to weight ratio, it's, it's more than 10 times you know, better than the internal combustion engine and a lot simpler, which is why Elon Musk originally wanted to go with that. Um, when he was first toying with all of this, he loved the idea of the piston torque, and he loved the idea of not having a lot of moving parts, which is, is what this is really good for. Uh, there's, there's no permanent magnet within our um, motors. There is a forever charging magnet that happens through the inverter, and there are no brushes as well. Um, that being said, we're converting DC to AC energy, like I said, and the gearbox. I'm sorry, the same picture is up all the time. This is what I was given. Um, <laughs> so like I said, uh, the gearbox is really a gear attached to the axle, more or less. Um, there, to put the car in reverse, all you're doing is putting the motor in reverse, um, so there is no transmission in this car. Uh, it's just such a simple mechanism. Um, How's the gearbox lubricated? Um, I don't know. So, so things I'm not allowed to talk about, um, other than what I say, are materials that we use in things. Um, and I'm going to say, more often than not, a few times coming up here, um, and that's my way of saying I'm not really supposed to say what's inside of these things, and I don't even really know. They don't tell me these things, but I'm not allowed to say if I knew. Um, hey, I got a quick question for you, yes. and I apologize. Maybe the room can answer this one. Why do you convert to AC? Why don't you just run the whole damn thing on DC? I don't know. Is there is there is there, is there, is there a good answer yeah. to that one? DC, um, this, it, the efficiency goes down while yeah. AC, um, the conversion of the loss of, of of energy is like substantially less because when you're transferring the energy from the, the battery to the motor, you have to consider it going from the stator to the rotor, and then you have the induction magnetic fields, the induction current um, going back and forth, and through all that, you're having a lot of loss in energy. But if you have your DC, yeah, you have brush, brushes and all that of the sorts, but with the AC, it's simple. You convert the um, DC to AC and then convert, convert it back through, um, what's it called? Putting the energy back into the battery afterwards, once it passes the um, the synchronous, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, so effectively, it's more efficient. You don't. Oh yeah. You don't Way waste. Uh, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. I just got my answer. answer. <laughs> I'm all yeah. good. There we go. Cool. Now I know. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few different battery packs. I got to interject. Is yeah. This is a group of double E's. Remember? Yeah. I like it. I like that. <laughs> They use DC motors in trains. Right. And the reason they do that is because they have the maximum torque at zero speed. They just carry turn move anything at zero speed. Mm -hmm. And there's very little loss of energy in doing that. You go to a subway train in, in I don't know about the new ones with the single rails, but you go to a subway but train in New, in New York City, for example, they're all DC motors running on 600 volts. Aren't right. trains going at a constant speed, though? No, they no. They stop at stations and start no. up and no. stop and start up. And they use, they, they, they uh, on stopping, they re they, the power goes back into the system. But what I'm saying, they're in constant. When they're when the trains are moving, they're staying in one like speed the whole time, right? No, no, they're, they're no. Slowly they're not. Speed. No, 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 it's fair. Absolutely not. No, no. Terrible. Yeah, it's fair. But there's some other reason. We're we're not getting the reason. But what <laughs> you're saying is not wrong. But there's more to it than that. Cool. Yeah. All right. Keep going. Anyway, <laughs> now we know. Back to you. Ask me that question again. We'll um, so we have two battery packs that we sell right now. Um, and so what we're looking at, we're looking at the stats of the Model S. The Model X is the same exact battery and component, so everything is going to be a little bit less. A little bit less acceleration, a little bit less top speed. Actually, the top speed is really governed by a computer, um, but in a little significantly less range. It's almost twice the weight. Um, so the 75 kilowatt hour battery, you see the D, that means dual motor, um, like I said. So it has a 259 EVA rated range. Now that is all dependent on your external factors here. So that is determined a 65 miles an hour, 
70 degrees outside, using the AC and listening to music. Now, when I drive an S, I have a projected range of about 265. Um, I noticed that when you first get a car, you go through what I call the honeymoon phase, and you're going to get about half of that. It's all from acceleration. Um, and, and, and actually, the hotter it is outside, the more range you're going to get for your battery cells, which is pretty good for us being in Florida. Yes, as you're holding it. Is there a break-in period for the batteries, or can you just floor it off the, off the shower? Yeah, we, when cars come out of the factory with zero miles on it, um, in Fremont, all they do is 0 to 155 accelerations for um, about 12 miles of the car. Um, and then when they get back to Florida, we do 0 to 60s um, on side streets to kind of, they don't need to have a break-in period though. Um, and, and it doesn't, and I hate saying this, it doesn't really matter how you treat these batteries uh, because we have an 8 year infinite mile warranty on the entire powertrain. Um, there are software things in place that if you do have the performance model, you can only do what we call ludicrous mode, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, a few times. Um, so, so excuse me, so there's people at Tesla who do nothing but accelerate cars? Yeah. All day. <laughs> you want that job? I would like to have that job. 0 to 150 over and over and over again? Okay, yeah, no, I'm going to probably... I bet you'd be tired of the neck. So the maintenance for these cars are relatively low then? Yeah, we, it's more of a doctor's appointment than a real car maintenance. So you bring it in once a year every 12,500 miles. Um, so I just, and before I get into this, I just had a, car, a guy trading this 2012 that 330,000 miles, and the salesperson in 2012 told him they are maintenance free, I think to kind of sell him the car. So he never brought in for maintenance and there's nothing wrong. Um, and so we notice things like, so, and we're going to get to regen. Um, so with regenerative braking, you don't have to replace your brake pads as often. Um, we're noticing on average about 150,000, maybe 200,000 miles on people's cars. Because you're only using your brake pads at speeds of 12 miles an hour and below. So the wear and tear on them at that point is pretty much nothing. These cars are heavier than your average sedan. So things like tires, you might have to replace more often. Yeah. I want to explain the regenerative braking. I got a whole, I got a whole fun activity okay. with that. <laughs> I have this whole mathematical it's equation. We like you do it in reverse electronic. There you go. <laughs> um, other than that, we do small things. We'll replace your key fob batteries every year. Uh, windshield wiper blades. You know, rotate your tires, which don't have to be rotated as often as other cars uh, because of the even distribution of weight. So it's important. Every two years, though, we flush, flush the brake fluid. I can't talk. And every four years, the battery coolant fluid. Um, if you don't come in for those, you can void warranties. Uh, but other than that, you know, there really is not a whole lot of maintenance. And every 500,000 miles, we service your motor. So we expect these motors are designed to go a million miles. That's kind of the idea behind them. Um, so these cars should last a lot longer than your car. Um, and because the battery packs are composed of over 7,000 cells, we don't really, we're not, in, we're not the market of fixing things. We're in the market of replacing your battery pack and fixing on the back end. So if you come in for service, more than likely, we're just going to pop out your battery pack and put a new one in. That process takes about two minutes. Um, it's a really simple thing. Um, we just put new bolts on our Model S and X, so it takes a little bit longer than it used to. Um, and the motors take about 50 minutes to take each one out with the battery pack already in. Um, it's like the easy, when I see them work on these cars, I mean, they're like texting and like taking out a battery pack. In one it's really neat. What is um, smart air suspension? The smart air suspension. So we have coil suspension in most cars, and these have air suspension. Um, that used to be an option, so right now they're saying included when it's standard on every vehicle as of two weeks ago. Um, the reason it's, so other cars do have air suspension. We have GPS memory smart technology air suspension. So if I want to come home and my garage has a really tall lift to get in, I'm going to put my suspension on high. My car is going to remember my GPS location, so every time I come home, my car will raise up. The opposite to that is automatic lowering. So I like to set, personally I like to put automatic lowering to 65 miles an hour. When I get on the highway and I hit 65, my suspension goes on low, giving me the most efficiency possible. Um, within that, if you are stationary or you're moving, with the touch of the touch screen, you can change your suspension from very high to very low, and there's um, you know, all these different settings to that. Um, and that, that changes with software updates. Um, so you know, fine tuning that stuff, you know, we're collecting data, we're learning the best way to make these cars as efficient as possible. Um, and it, the amount of height that you get will change over time just due to data that we collect. Um, and the next trim level. So it's the same battery. It's still the 100 kilowatt hour battery, but it is now the performance model. Um, so the performance motor is basically two of our standard motors put right together. Um, so it's twice the weight, a little bit more than two times the horsepower, and uh, a lot more torque. Uh, if you did the ludicrous speed, which is like a fun Easter egg, you have to 
touch a button and ask, are you, what does it say now, Thomas? It says, do you want to call your mom or something like that? It's like, yeah. So it squats the back end of your car down and it literally launches you. It has about 1.3 g-forces of gravity. Um, so you can put your cell phone against your seat and it'll stay against that seat until you're done accelerating. Um, it's, it's nauseating, to say the least. Um, so that says 2.5. Motor trend consistently gets 2.280 to 60, um, so it is extremely fast. Now, the P100D that you have up there, would that actually be on the outside of the vehicle? Like if I yeah, so you have a badge on the back, so no, so we mass produce our cars, so there's, you can't look at a car side on to know what battery size it is. The only way to tell by looking at a car is to see if they have, if they have red calipers, uh, only the P100s can get that option. Um, otherwise, on the back, the badge will say P100. But I've seen people with 60 kilowatt hour batteries order those badges off the internet. <laughs> 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 I've also seen people with P100s come in with 60 badges. So, yeah. Um, when they're increasing the batteries, um, are they increasing the size? And as they're put in inside the car, or is it the batteries getting more dense? I'm just curious. Um, there's a few things happening. So up until recently, we had a 60 and a 75 kilowatt hour battery and a 90 and 100. The 60 and the 75 were physically the same exact size battery. It was how much software are you buying from us that we're gonna let you use? So if you have a 60 right now, you can go on your phone, say pay the $2,000 and you have unlocked the 75. You don't even have to come into our facility. Now all of a sudden your car has about 50 miles more of range. You can come in if you want a new badge, but you know the idea is that you can, you can buy things off your phone in the middle of nowhere and get them to your car. If you didn't buy the Enhanced Autopilot software when you took delivery, you can buy it off your phone right then and there, and now your car is mostly autonomous. Wait, um, it has the ability to be fully autonomous. Why is there that big gap then? Can you, can you upgrade from the 75 to the 90? No, so then the 90 and the 100 are the same size, and the gaps are only there for price. Um, so the difference from a 60, or what we don't sell, 75 kilowatt hour battery, which starts at 69,000, and then the 100, which is about, uh, what is it, 98,000, and then the P100, which is about 140,000. Um, so the P100 doesn't have any more range, it doesn't have a different battery, you're just paying for a toy, you're paying for that acceleration is all. Wait, so the batteries are all the same in all the batteries? Well, no, the, the, the 75 and the 100 are different size batteries. Um, they, the, the 100 has about, uh, I think, uh, 2,000 more cells than the other one, but it has the same amount of modules, so it changes. And when I talk about this, I'm only going to talk about the 60 kilowatt hour battery. So there's more modules, or the same amount of modules, there's more cells per module in the bigger battery size, but we always stick with 16. Okay. A, a cell is just 18650 batteries, a few of them? Uh, about 7,000. The smallest one is 7,122 or something like that. So, and those, and for size reference, those are about twice the size of a AA battery. Um, they're dry battery technology, I'm going to get into that as well. That is what it looks like. This is what we're talking about right now. You're counting 15 modules because this forward most facing one is double stacked. Um, and that will be the front end of your vehicle. Um, so you can see all those dots, those are all the battery cells. Um, each of those cells, so there's 16 modules, there's six groups in each module which run parallel. In between each one of those is the glycerin coils that keep these cool, so there's no uneven heating. Uh, there's, it's, it's really nice, it makes things really efficient. Um, and then there's 74 cells in each group. Like I said, I'm only talking about the 60 kilowatt hour battery right now. Um, so you can see how many cells, there's 7,118650 cells. I think there's a little bit more than that as well. Um, so each of these cells, or each of these modules, are 24 volts. Um, and I'm going to get into the. I'm going to get closer, zoom in more and more. We're we'll getting into the batteries in a second. Um, so when you're running two of these battery packs, you're getting 48 volts, um, and so on. You know, 24 for each one. They purposely make it so to touch both ends of this battery pack would be impossible with one person. Uh, so they're really safe batteries to work with, um, and there's not that much current going through one module at a time. Not that I recommend trying to test out 24 volts, but you know, it's, it's really not all that much. Um, so the whole thing itself is about a 400 volt tap. Um, this is what they look like. This is actually a modified Panasonic 18650 battery. Um, we worked with Panasonic for a while. In fact, with the Model 3, we're, it's sort of the opposite. We worked with their engineering team, but now we're sort of selling the batteries back to them. Um, these are slightly different, and I, the only thing I can really get into why is that they have, uh, they're copper plated is really the only thing I'm allowed to say. Um, and the only thing I really know about this. Um, so each of these are four volts a piece, and they're, they're wired in parallel so that the voltage doesn't increase with each battery size, it remains consistent, but it increases with each, with each module. Um, so they each have a 25 amp current capability as well. And I'm sure you all know that means much more than myself. Um, so now I'm gonna get into kind of the guts of these batteries. So it is a coil, what it is, 
is you have the separator, then you have your positive electrode, then your separator, then your negative electrode, then your separator. And that is wound up really tightly within each, when he, within each one of these. Um, so most of the time, the case, uh, the, the sheets inside these cases are submerged in organic solvents, and that is normally ether. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what we use, but that's what Panasonic normally uses. Um, like I said, that is probably one of the differences. Um, and the separated, the, the separator is a microperforated plastic, so it still allows the ions to move within the, uh, the positive and the negative electrodes. Um, the positive electrode is the lithium cobalt oxide. Um, the Model 3, from what I understand, is going to be slightly different, the technology and the dimensions of the battery. That's where the name 18650 comes from. The dimensions of the new batteries are very different. They're um, a little bit larger, and they have twice the density, um, but they're not twice the size. Um, and the negative electrode is made up of carbon. Um, that being said, do we have any questions about the guts of this battery before I move on that maybe someone else could possibly answer? How safe is it? Yeah, so it is. Because it is dry battery technology, it's actually safer than your standard 12 volt car battery is. Um, and I hate giving this example, but more people last year died of Porsche's 12 volt car batteries than our batteries in total. Um, and so there, if and you can watch all these YouTube videos of people shooting guns and bone arrows at them. They're not going to explode on impact. Um, if you put them under flame, they could be dangerous and they'll act like bottle rockets shooting everywhere. Um, but as far as front front end collision happens, if a Tesla hits a wall, nothing's going to happen. If a Tesla hits a combustion engine car, uh, you could be underwater there. We got a few questions here. Yeah, I, I thought there was uh, one disaster where it ran over something that went through the covering of the battery case, and that caused the accident. So that was before the days of titanium sleeves and uh, silicone packs. Um, so potentially pre 2014, they were a little bit more dangerous. Before we did all, before we have all this consumer data that happens just from people buying our cars and seeing what happens. Um, so now that that's happened and there's been enough accidents, we sort of learned from that, um, and it, it's much safer than it ever has been. If you hit water, go off a bridge into the water. Yeah, so um, it'll immediately down. short circuit. If you get in into a, any sort of collision, um, and it, this happens actually before the airbags go off, um, your battery will disconnect itself. Each module will basically, the breaker, you know, everything, everything disconnects. So it's, it's, it gets safe, and you can watch this video. So it shorts? Yeah, shorts. So, yeah, sorry. You guys are the engineer, not me. Uh, um, and so you can watch this video with this guy. He was this is a few months ago. He uploaded this video from Russia. He drove and he was fully submerged halfway up the windows, and he was able to fully drive his car around the water like that. Um, and that's because these are airtight seals that things cannot go into the battery pack, but um, air can come out of the battery pack in case decompression needs to happen. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, we had a Richard Hammond drive off a cliff in a different company, an uh, all-electric hybrid car. Um, called the Rebac Concept 1 that had about 1,100 horsepower. Um, and he basically drove off a cliff and rolled, rolled a bunch and hit a road stuff. And eventually, like, pretty quickly, within minutes, the car was all in flames. Do you think Tesla has something in place to kind of prevent fires happening from possibly puncturing the cells? Maybe the dry battery technology or something? Yeah, I would have to say that would be it, because from, from my understanding, puncturing the cells won't set these on fire. I'm not sure exactly what kind of technology they have. Yeah. I agree. Um, but not many parts of this would be flammable. And there's like a lot of third party videos you can watch and YouTube of people literally shooting the battery and stuff and nothing happens. Um, I know that batteries get hot like very quickly. And so I know you guys have like a cooling system going on. Uh, do those have to be replaced ever so often? Or how does that yeah, the work? cooling system is replaced. It uses uh, glycerin. So those are glycerin ribbons that, if I go back a few pictures, they, uh, they weave in and out. Of every, they touch every single cell, so they're going to weave in and out like this, up and down every row. And uh, so that fluid we flush every four years, uh, but that makes it so there's no hot spots and there's you know no thermal patches within this battery pack at all. So each battery is cooled evenly. Oh wow! So it's all in equilibrium, like one cell on one side of the car is going to be the same temperature as one on the other mm -hmm. side. Well, and they're all going to be charged the same amount. So when I have a 90% uh, battery on my car, every single one of these cells is charged 90% of the way. Not just you know my four most battery pack is exhausted by you know ten percent. Now, likewise, when you're using your battery pack and you use one percent of your battery pack, I guess you've used one percent from every single cell. Mm -hmm. the car battery. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about regenerative braking. I know you guys were just talking about it. <laughs> um, so regenerative braking that is storing the kinetic energy in the form of electricity without wasting it as heat. Um, 
So the induction motor actually acts as a generator. So normally when you're driving forward, your induction rotor speed is less than that of the rotating magnet field. Um, but when you're talking about redundant braking, it's the opposite. Um, and to kind of control that, that's what the inverter is mostly, well not mostly, that's one of the jobs of the inverter is to control that. Um, so a fun question, I don't know if any of you guys have looked this up, but how much would it take to fully recharge a Tesla Model S battery, 60 kilowatt hour, by pushing it down a hill? You know, what size hill, what do you find all that? <laughs> so, 60 kilowatt hour battery, we're going to translate that into joules. So it's 2.16 times 10 to the 8th joules. The weight of a model, a dual motor 60D is uh, 2,108 kilograms. So we know the mass, we know what gravity is. So, um, potential energy. We know the potential energy already. It's a 60 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so what we need to find is the height of this hill that we're going to fall down. So, simple math. Height is 10.44 kilometers because we know all the other variables within this. Um, but, that being said, we're not going to push our car down that type of hill because there is a loss in energy. The loss in energy I'm just about to go over does not include wind resistance. It doesn't include what type of ground we're on. Um, <coughs> so we assume that there is a 60% loss in energy. And that happens from in regenerate braking. That happens because the wheel has to go to the gear reduction, to the motor, to the inverter, to the battery. So, that being said, we actually need a 17.409 tall kilometer hill. So, what is that tall? Well, Mount Everest is 8.48. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you need to push our base model, which is no longer our base model, down Mount Everest twice um, at what slope? So, we can find X. <laughs> I'm sure you're all enjoying this now, right? Uh, so, we can find X, you know, uh, rise over run, Y over X. With a 10% grade, we can find out that X is 174 kilometers. So, then we have to use Pythagorean theorem to find D. Simply put, um, 174 squared plus 17.4 squared, we have to take the square root of that. So we have to push this down 174.86 kilometer long hill. So it's not really extremely efficient, um, but it doesn't have to be efficient because it's actually the safest way to drive. So if you, and I'm sure you all felt this during your test drive, when you right when you came off that accelerator, your car started pushing down the brakes it felt like. Um, so if you were about to get in a front end collision and you needed to slam on the brakes, you're already halfway there just by coming off the accelerator. The other part to that is, although we're not producing that much extra energy, we're also not putting wear and tear in our brake pads. Um, so you're gonna learn this one pedal drive, and this is truly the lazy man's car. Um, I'm not sure if any of you got to experience walking up to the Model X, the door opens for you, you sit down, you hit the brake, the door closes on you. It's a seamless experience. This is all part of that. Um, although our regenerative braking is a lot more efficient than other electric cars are, um, the Model 3 is even more efficient, which is actually really exciting. Um, so I'm excited to kind of see what that math will be with that. Um, the air coefficient of our sedan is uh, 0.24, which is the lowest coefficient of any production car. Um, which is pretty neat that our production car has that, because it's also the quickest zero to 60 production car. It's also the safest sedan ever built. Um, it has more technology and the only autonomous vehicle really ever built. Um, so it's a lot of fun. So, this is sort of the end of my side. I was gonna show another video, but unfortunately it's, it's not really working. Um, so just so you know, we produce 90 million vehicles worldwide, not we as in Tesla, we as the world, um, and only 0.2% of those are electric vehicles. Um, so, you know, so we're really trying to work towards pushing that number up. You know, These cars are so safe, they're so quick, they're a lot of fun, um, and once they're fully autonomous, Elon Musk's kind of end goal here, he has two things. He says energy and traffic are soul-crushing things. If we can solve those two, it doesn't matter. We can do anything else we want. Um, so that's sort of great. as much as you want, but you are out for the evening. Yeah. That's, I get that question all the time. Um, are you able, and I'll, I'll go through that, are you able to drink and drive and get behind? Um, so when you first get into a Tesla, and I doubt any of you actually did this today, you're supposed to click accept terms and agreements to the software. So if anything happens, you are reliable for what happened during that software. We're trying to actually move past that with fully autonomous hardware where we as a company are going to be responsible. Um, and because we truly believe it's going to be the safest way to drive. He said, right now, the software is about as safe as one in 100 lifetimes. You won't get into an accident. He wants it to be as safe as one in 1,000 lifetimes, um, which is crazy to think that if I lived 1,000 lifetimes, I'd only get in one accident. And it wouldn't necessarily be a devastating accident. Um, do we have any more questions about any of that stuff? Or any questions about Model 3 specifically? Or an open discussion if you guys want to talk yeah. about stuff I can learn. Yeah? I understand there's two levels of regenerative braking. Mm -hmm. Say anything about that? Like one of them regenerates maximum, and the other one is so they can put up the gas and slow down as fast. Yeah, I'm not. Forward, I'm not 
I don't have too much information about that. Um, I, I don't really want to talk about that because I don't know too much about that. But if, if you want me to find out, I can definitely find out more about that. Yeah, uh, you know, Miguel? We have the, the mode in standard and low. Oh, oh, is, oh, is that? Okay. Are you talking about the settings to it? Well, you, There's, you can choose whether it's Yeah, okay, yeah. So everything has settings. So um, if you put your vendor braking on low, it's essentially turning it off. It's like any combustion engine car. When you see a red light, you stop a few hundred yards beforehand, you come off your gas, and you drift there. With the Tesla, you pretty much go full steam ahead until you're like 50 feet in front of the light, and then you come off the accelerator and you rapidly slow down. Um, I don't ever recommend turning that on low because it's not a safe way to drive as compared to what it could be. Um, so most people keep that on standard, but everything is settings. If you wanted, and I'm not sure if anybody went over this in this test drive, but you can change your suspension, the tightness of steering, you know, and all these things are profile specific. So when I get into my car with my key fob, my suspension's gonna lower, the music I want's gonna go on, you know, all my settings, if I want it in Celsius versus Fahrenheit, whatever I want, it's gonna be that way. But if, uh, you know, somebody else, not that I have a wife or a girlfriend, but if they had a key fob to my car, they could get in, and it's gonna be a completely different car. Um, and you can change all these things while you're in motion or you're stationary, which is pretty neat. Yeah? There's Good. approximately 300 million people in the U.S. How are the power companies gonna support charging half of that? Yeah, so this, that's an interesting topic. So uh, my solar guy was out there earlier, I'm not sure if any of you met him, Dominic, and he was saying how ironic it is we're in here. Um, but, um, so we're trying to sort of solve that energy issue, and I'm gonna go back to the beginning. You know, buying one of our products is a great way to start, but if you came full circle with all of our products, the idea is, and you could just buy one of these and it would even solve, help you solve this crisis. So you have this power wall in the middle. So during peak hours, or during off-peak hours, really, we can store energy when it's the cheapest, which here we don't really have charged rates, but in California, they pay twice as much uh, money for electricity when everybody gets home at night versus you know the middle of the afternoon when nobody's home using any electricity. So if somewhere in California were to charge this when energy is cheap and no one's using it and then use that energy at nighttime, it sort of relieves that pressure. However, if you took it a step further, you can charge that energy pack from the sun by your solar panels and then you're charging your car completely off solar. So obviously right now not everybody can afford one of our vehicles, the solar and the power wall. Although there are incentive programs in place, for example, if you bought our solar panels and our power wall, you have a 30% federal tax credit. So if you have a $20,000 system, you're gonna get 30,000 of that back. And then we have the $7,500 tax rebate for the car itself, just for vehicle measure. Um, so technically, people can get the Model 3 for, you know, in California, some people are getting it for about uh, $18,000 after state, federal, and company incentives, wow. which is crazy. Wow. Um, so we don't have any state incentives out here. Um, yeah yet, or I wish we did, um, you know, so although there's a sort of a lag effect, it's like we're creating all this, these electric cars, and it used to be you're creating all these electric cars with nowhere to charge, we've gotten over that, now it's, well, where's the demand in electricity going to come from? And that's sort of the next two months that, and we're trying to solve that. Like, One more question of that effect, has anybody figured out price per gallon based on your current power bill? What I'll be paying. Yeah, so for every thousand miles you drive with the 60 kilowatt hour battery Model S driving at normal speeds, it's going to cost you $30 at home at 12.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and so, you know, most people drive under 100 miles a day, so it's, you know, if you drive 100 miles, it's about three bucks. Um, but the efficiency of that always changes. And we actually have an EPA miles per gallon rated range of 102 miles per gallon on the Model S, and that's based off of the fact that when I'm plugging the wall here and I don't have solar, I'm pulling from the power plant who is actually using fossil fuels. So because a fossil fuel, fuel plant is more efficient than a combustion engine, that's why we have better miles per gallon than a combustion engine. Mm -hmm. the, the home charger, I think I read somewhere, is 40 amps, uh, 240 volts at 40 amps? Or um, it depends. Normally we recommend the NEMA 1450, so it's a 240 50 amp plug. 50 amp. That will charge you at a rate of 37 miles per hour. Now at the house I live in, I don't need to get something installed because where the dryer used to be is an EMA 1430, so it's a 30-amp plug. That charges me slower, but it charges me at 24 miles per hour. So, I mean, I only like drive six miles per hour. My question is, yeah. Yeah. Amps per no, miles per hour. So every hour I'm plugged in, I'm yeah. going to get 24 miles of range. No, but <laughs> my question is, the way it connects, how can you talk at all to the group about the safety? I mean, what happens if you plugged it in the garage and you happen to have a gas uh, gasoline container for your lawnmower or something nearby. Is there any sparking or does it not start charging until it makes a solid connection? Yeah, so there's a few things that'll happen. Um, it's not gonna start charging and there's sort of a, uh, 
like a fuse box on the actual charging cable, sort of like the laptop has. Um, but it's not going to start charging, so you plug into the car, and even then, it doesn't actually start charging for about 30 seconds. Um, so it's not live in your hand. No, it's not live in your hand. And, and, and a good example of that is we have these in the showroom, and like infant kids come up and are, are sticking their fingers in. Nothing's <laughs> happened yet. So I don't have any <laughs> but everything seems to be working all right so far. <laughs> How, how much is a supercharger? Super it's 750 amps. Um, that's so when you go to a supercharger, um, if you look at them, they're going to be lettered and numbered here. Um, so on an eight stall system, you're going to have one A, one B, one C, one D, and then two A, two B, two C, and two D. I don't know if you can see that the letter under there. If you're on one A and four chargers down will be one B. If you were the only two people there, you're sharing the charge, but it's not split 50-50, it's more like 60-40, it was whoever was there first. Um, <laughs> so, um, and you can monitor all this from the car, so when you plug in, it shows you how many volts you're pulling, how many amps you're pulling, how many miles per hour you're charging. When I say that, I'm saying, if I'm plugged in for an hour, how many miles am I going to get? Um, and just for reference, if I try to plug into this 110, at most, I'll get four miles of range for every hour I'm plugged in. Usually, I get about one or two at my house when I try to do that. Um, those, power, those power walls that you can install in your house, how much do they cost? Um, I think they're $5,500 before incentives, and they are 14.5 kilowatt hours. At a residential home, you can have up to four of those. One of those will power a three-bedroom house using a little bit of AC, cooking dinner, using all the lights. Um, you choose what products you want hooked up to that. Um, so most people have what we call the essentials plugged up. So if you are in a hurricane, and some people use those just as a generator. So if I just have the power wall, no solar panels or no car, it's going to be fully charged, so when everybody else's power goes out, I still have 14.5 kilowatt hours of energy I can pull from. And that obviously being Tesla comes with a smart cell phone app, and it's a totally integrated system. You said five grand? 5,500 before incentives. So there's the 30% federal tax credit that we get. Oh, really? Yeah. But I believe, and I can I can refer you to Dominic, our solar guy, but I believe you <coughs> either have solar or plan to get solar and get the 30% tax credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything to discourage people who don't have Teslas from parking in supercharger spots? So this is the whole thing about superchargers. People always ask me, where are the superchargers? Well, there's no umbrella definition for that. So the ones at Brandon <coughs> are general 30-minute parking. So if you are not a Tesla, you can park there for 30 minutes. That parking lot's big enough that we don't have to deal with those issues as Tesla owners over there. Um, some places who we've worked out different contracts with are strictly Tesla. Um, spots and you can be towed um, and some of them are just like hopefully you can park in there and there's a story and it, and it kind of paints <coughs> uh, there's a, a mom her husband and three little children they just drove across the country and they got to their hotel on the east on the west coast that has superchargers but they were not restricted to Tesla's at the time until she came out with the story and every single parking spot was taken up with a combustion engine car and it was like four in the morning she almost ran out of electricity so instead of waking up the next morning to go you know, go to Disney and all that. Um, they had to wait to charge until people left the hotel. So we've worked out where now superchargers that are being built are under certain restrictions, but previously when we were just scrapping and trying to put them everywhere, they're a little bit more loosely defined. There's actually nails. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta see, uh, the Tesla, the nails go down, and if you don't, the nails stay up. So <laughs> <laughs> yep. <Yeah. coughs> so you guys said, obviously, with as this grows, energy is going to be an issue, but do you think in the future it'll be an issue for the charging stations as well? Maybe, you know, you might need full facilities that have charging stations if it's busy enough. Yeah, so, enough. and you can see this. If you say, you know, navigate Boston on the navigation on our cars, it'll show you how, where you have to stop at for how long, how many people are charging at that very second, so you're not going to head somewhere if there's already a lot of people there. Um, we're doubling the size of our network this year and tripling it by the end of next year with the superchargers. That being said, Teslas can use every other company's charger. Everybody uses the connection with they refer to as the J1772. Uh, we don't use that. Um, we don't use that because we're, we're trying to put out more energy than other cars are. So like a BMW i8 has a 20 mile range. So they don't need to put out 750 amps to fully charge your car. You can plug it into a one kind outlet and fully charge in a few hours. Um, so you know we can use everybody else's, nobody else can use ours. So when you use ChargePoint, which is another company's uh, charger, you won't be able to see how many people are there before you get there. And uh, more often than not, those charging stalls are broken, but they get fixed relatively quickly or so. Um, but the idea is that Teslas are so versatile, unlike other electric cars, that you could like literally plug in anywhere on 
like other cars, you have to have a specific at home charger set up or you have to have a specific J1772 and you don't get these adapters and that and the other thing, you know. So um, we're, and we invest in um, capital, I mean, we invest in infrastructure strictly, so we don't have any money in marketing or advertising. Um, so that way, when you're paying for a car, you're not paying for a billboard, you're paying for the supercharger. That comes with it. The other thing, too, the superchargers are growing. So, like, the big ones in California used to be like 24, and now we're building 20 of them in Sarasota. So, the stations are actually, as we build them, are also getting much larger. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. The average, you know, with, and I don't know if this was already answered or not, uh, the, the motor itself. Yeah. Amperage. What's the average so amp draw? The, uh, the 60 kilowatt, the motor that's on the 60s, the 75s, and the 100s, I'm not talking about the 100s. Uh, so it's a 270 volt, let me see if I have that up there. I know that it's very different for the P100, obviously. Um, it depends on which driving mode, but I'm just figuring just an average of what. Yeah. Um, we know the kilowatt output per hour, um, but our cars don't actually like tell us the average output. So you can look into a dome more and get a little more into it. So like on the actual energy yeah, meter, it tells you how many kilowatt right. hour you're using yeah, and right. accelerate and stuff like that. Usually somewhere around, right. like, yeah, it's different person's about 380, most people are right around 440. Um, but it doesn't actually tell you the amperage, so. Right, and it, it depends on your speed. And it depends on how you drive. Yeah, yeah, average. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah average, average is, is yeah. like yeah. right around 380, uh, 440 for kilowatt hour charging. So like this, you don't longer charge your battery or something else. Yeah. It'll automatically stop. Yeah, yeah, so you can't, it's not like a cell phone. So like your cell phone, you don't want to get home with 90% battery and plug it in, you're just going to kind of let it die overnight. Um, you want to plug these cars in whenever you can. Um, so if you're at a 90% charge and you want to charge 95, you can plug in. Uh, there's a lot of mechanisms in place that protect the battery from overcharging. One of them you do personally, you know, we call it a charge limit. So you can select between 50 and 100% of your battery how much you want to charge. The lower you are, the more efficiency it'll bring you know, in a 10, 20, 30 year period. Um, but even if you did hurt your battery by doing something to it, you're protecting that warranty. And that's kind of what we're all about. It's like, and a lot of this is learning for us. So it's like, if you notice your efficiency, you know, five years from now, it's not what we told you're going to get. We're just going to give you a new battery pack, and we're going to learn from that and kind of change the way that our charging works. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I'm sorry about an engineer, but uh, I hope you guys learned a lot. coming out tonight. Thank you very much, guys. I think, uh, first off, we got to play with the toys. So oh, that's, yeah. That's always a good thing. Right? And the information was also very, very helpful, so thank you very much. Uh, I typically like to reward our speakers, <laughs> not with a plaque or anything silly you put on the wall, but rather something that you like to eat. Are you uh, nuts or no nuts? I'm everything. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. Our Actual real engineering questions that you want to answer, I can answer those for you on the back end. So uh, I'll email everybody who signed up for the test drive, um, and anyone else can just reach out to me. Um, I'll leave my business cards up here if someone wants to grab one. I'm also going to leave our Solar Guys business cards if you have any solar related questions. Yeah. Fantastic. Before you leave, take a cookie instead of one.